Belton, where there was a child abuse case, and we were working up a mixed election strategy. And um, this has really weakened the environmental movement. I mean, in some ways, uh, Greens went letting about what, what green politics means and become much more radical and much more questioning of the you know, conventional wisdom if we don't have an impact and make an impact in time and uh, work together with uh, I mean, I've worked on a couple of commissions seeing that, and that's why I now have proposed recently that we create a permanent, or I know Buddhists don't like the word permanent, so let's call it an ongoing institution, which I call the World Future Council, <coughs> which basically is based on ideas which the Dalai Lama, uh, President Gorbachev, Vaclav Havel have come up with in recent times, saying we need a sort of global conscience, we need a body which speaks out for our values, ethical values with you, and this also to learn your perspective uh, working in the South on poverty and um, poverty eradication in an age of so-called globalization, because of course we don't really have any real globalization. We have an economic, corporate-led globalization benefiting the rich, benefiting a small minority in the South. It's only terrorism because of course it is a big threat to our, our global elite. We were not threatened by, by TV and to not be threatened by traffic accidents because they have a couple of outriders protecting them on it. Go out driving. Poverty is different. There are the statistics coming out, being churned out by various institutions, usually linked to the World Bank, which say that you know, things are really improving. And um, there is the reality of people coming, for example, Gustavo Esteva, who lives in the slums in Mexico City, a former UN, high UN employee, who says that uh, the reality on the ground is much worse than what he sees in the famous past that we have for the rich. So there is a justice issue there, but surely things are getting better for them. And uh, you know, we have all these figures, and Vandana said you have got the wrong figures, you have got the wrong indicators since 2030, yes, maybe even more. Because uh, your indicators which just measure people's entry into the money economy, into the market economy, <coughs> but they don't measure it means and whether it's, it's a pro uh, whether it actually means progress. Because um, I find quite often it means the modernization of our poverty. Quite often it means that people who are quite happy to drink water suddenly now think that, you know, if you're thirsty, you must drink uh, Coca-Cola. When I went to, to work in the, in the Caribbean, I found that, you know, you have to... A farmer can afford is a, is a set with a quality iron mine in which the, uh, the small children die of people's birth during the day. And you get to some of the experiences you're going to be... The Philippines is being interested in... in
that it doesn't seem to stand any chance of doing that. Some friends of mine now from Austria and Germany have developed the, the concept of an ecological Marshall Plan. We need an ecological Marshall Plan to you know, help the, the poor. We need, to, we need to instigate a global market economy. Because if we continue with this neoliberal market economy, we're going to face increasing collapse of our societies, uh, of the environment, increasing terror, etc. And I said, yes, you know, you're quite right, but you know, who is going to do this? Didn't get anywhere. So I mean, I think we know what needs to be done, but we don't really have clear strategies to get from here to there. And if you say, well, you know, what on earth is the World Future Council to do with this? Well, all I say, they have set up strong institutions with, with strong powers, the IMF, the WTO, etc. <coughs> to run their show. And if they tell us all the time, we don't need new institutions. You know, we should think why maybe that is. And, you know, go in and try to work through that institution. You pretty much, much find that they are institutions representing us in our much, much broader perspective as citizens, as world citizens. Then I think, you know, that is not the end of it, but it will be a very powerful shift. It's humorous. That it's not the question of creating some new ethics out of nowhere, where it's supposed to come from. You have this. We are all citizens, and we've always been citizens, and consumers have just been a small part of that, and now people disease in, in Africa, because it is. Every one of us has a daily choice to be part of the problem, part of the... ...which we can attack, but first of all, we need to formulate our alternatives in an ongoing way. We can't just have a commission or a meeting or some conference, someone which produces a nice declaration which ends up on our bookshelves. And we have to see that now is a unique opportunity. Because um, as late as the Johannesburg summit in 2002, the elites of the South, who as I said before, in many ways, you know, the agents of the North, but they still have some kind of, they must have some kind of responsibility for their people in the South, because they know otherwise they could you know, check them out if they took too bad. They were basically um, accepting and supporting, promoting the Northern agenda of further global trade liberalization. <coughs> With almost without exception, in terms of and then suddenly in Cancun, they said no. They said no because they were suddenly fed up with how little they were getting. They were getting afraid of their people. They were getting afraid of NGO networks like the Purple Network, without whose pressure, and it was a focus for the Global South, you know, with our water recipient, water fellow. Without these people, this would not have happened. But the North, the Southern government suddenly changed signs and said no more. So they know what they are against. That this sort of formative alliance of the southern governments and the NGOs for, you know, formed to say no. But it hasn't yet formed on what to say yes to. And that, I think, is a, is a huge weakness. It's, it's a huge weakness that um, even the big, the big movements have not developed this. I mean, when you, you hear a lot of talks in many years about Buddhist economics, I mean, it was a term which even E.F. Schumacher wrote about what is beautiful brought to the West. And, you know, we have some idea what it means in the detail, but what it actually means <coughs> in practice on the national level, I'd like to know. I mean, if, if, if tomorrow those who are talking about Buddhist economics are in power, what will they do differently? I don't know. I ask the same thing about Islamic economics. You know, what is the answer of moderate Islam to the global crisis? When uh, President Wahid, a moderate, you know, really deep Islamic thinker, suddenly became president of the largest Islamic country on earth, and I said to his minister of technology, now, what is Islamic economics? What are you going to do? And he said, I don't really believe in that, you know, Islamic banking. It's not really working very well. We're going to call in the IMF. Now, of course, as moderates like that, you know, it's not surprising that the extremists are getting more, more and more adherence. And I think that is, you know, where our key work is now and where each one of us can, can make a difference. I mean, we never, we never know. I mean, I've learned this through my work. We never know when we're called upon to do something which, which can change the world. It can be a conversation we have, like happened to a um, little-known American poet called Gary Snyder years ago when the Vietnam War stopped. Why did the Vietnam War stop? Because the American government could no longer withstand the anger of the American people when they found out the secrets in the so-called Pentagon Papers, about, which had been hidden from them about what the USA was doing in Vietnam. And how did they find out these secrets? Because one mid-level bureaucrat uh, called Daniel Ellsberg decided at the risk of 30 years in jail and, and ruin and everything to leak these papers to the New York Times. What suddenly made him do it? Well, he was in Tokyo about a year previously, and he went into <coughs> the hotel bar at night. And this poet, Gary Snyder, had been doing a poetry reading in Tokyo. 
and staying in the same area, and if you happened to walk into the same bar and looked around and you saw this other American sitting there, and they got talking. And Ellsberg said to Snyder, what do you think about the war? And Snyder said, I think it's a, a criminal atrocity. And Ellsberg was quite shocked. He never actually met anybody with those opinions before. You know, he lived in a very secluded environment. And they talked all night. And then, you know, Snyder went home and Ellsberg went home. And a year later, it took him a year to go think through all the implications. Ellsberg sent a note to Gary Snyder saying, you know, I'm the man you spoke to in the, the bar in Tokyo a year ago. That conversation changed my life. Watch the newspapers. And next day he released the papers to the New York Times. So, you know, it, it matters. What you do, it matters if you talk to him in a bar at night. I think I'll stop there and be looking for questions. And it's uh, challenging, uh, not totally negative, because, I mean, as you say, as, as human beings, I mean, only trust the leaders and think that things will happen up there is maybe not enough. I mean, all of us can make a change. But I think this is an opportunity. I don't know which role you have in the World Future Council. I mean, can we raise issues for you to bring into the council? And maybe we can also raise questions about, I mean, what, what is on the agenda now in the near future? There you go. I'm the, uh, I had the idea of, of, of the, the World Future Council, but, you know, based on similar ideas which had come out of the books and writings and speeches of Babachev and of His Holiness of Dalai Lama, Bachelor Havel, etc., over the past 15 years, but nobody actually done anything about it. And I proposed it in a, in a radio talk I did in, in Germany. And I then got a call from German television and said, we like this so much that you can bring this about, we guarantee we'll televise it, you know, worldwide. And I thought, that's really quite amazing. Normally you work very hard to get something going, and you think, how can I get television interested? And here they come, and they say they're actually waiting. So I said, look, I'm already responsible for one underfunded international initiative, namely the Right Lab of the World, so there's no way I could possibly take this on. So they even introduced me to our first, um, our first ideas would be taken up. Well, we looked at, um, when I see we, this has been sort of a small group of, of volunteers really working on this. Um, Louis Barber is the director of Earth Action, this network I mentioned to you, to you before. We um, had a meeting uh, in Salzburg at the invitation of the governor there with about um, 30 people. Um, Tariq Banuri, uh, who runs the Stockholm Environment, um, office, um, Stockholm Environment Institute office in Boston at the moment, but uh, it's originally from, from Pakistan. He is one who actually said this should not just be a council of, of wise elders, it should be a council of wise elders, pioneers, and youth leaders. So. Um, He's been involved, there have been a number of people uh, from um, advising us and endorsing this idea, uh, Chandra Musafar. Uh, Sulek Sivaraksa has, has agreed to be on the initial um, board. We're now going to have about asking about 10 or 12 of the endorsers who include Nobel Peace Prize laureates and people on both sides of the spectrum and people in NGOs, people very, very, uh, you know, fighting the campaign against the World Bank, but also, interesting, privately, the, the president of the World Bank also tells me things to do with it. So it's an interesting uh, breadth of, of, of spectrum. And, of course, you know, the, the, the devil is in the detail, as the Germans say. You know, we'll find out what actually happens once the debates get going. It depends very much on the people you win to, to, to conduct them, to steer the debates. We've uh, found that there are about 20 issues you can obviously subdivide them further. Uh, which need global reform, beginning with good work for all, uh, water, healthy food for all, looking at, at health and healing, looking at human development, um, the children's rights, the various uh, key environmental issues, uh, justice, education for all. And um, it is quite clear that um, one problem at the moment is that these issues are dealt with in isolation. That um, when there's a problem, a commission is commissioned come up with a report which will then say um, we need to lower the retirement age in the West because youth unemployment is getting so serious and we need to have a lower retirement age. And then of course you have another commission which says we need to raise the retirement age because we can't afford to pay the pensions. And you have a retired commission which says it's really a worry for the global environment that the Chinese are consuming or buying so many new cars. But another one says it's really a worry for the global economy that the Japanese are not buying so many new cars anymore. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. And so, um, for the first time, we said, we will have all these issues under one umbrella. 
which means that we can link them, we can start saying, for example, why are all these um, energy saving proposals which go under headings like factor 4 or factor 10, that you can have so much energy efficiency that you can have the same amount of um, well-being uh, but just use one tenth of the energy. And I said to the authors of one of these books, you know, well, I mean, entrepreneurs are not stupid. If there are all these uh, niches, all these profits to be made, you know, why is it happening? And they said, oh, well, of course, it needs a financial reform, tax reform, reform of discounting regulations. I, the signs, the signals are wrong, which, uh, which are being sent at the moment. So it can't be done within the present framework. But that's sort of like, that's not his responsibility. You know, he's not an expert on this. So we said we need a, a framework where we can then have joint meetings with those who are experts in this, so we can come up with practical, actionable proposals, really with model legislation. And so the, at the moment, the, the wage is really for the funding which will enable the launch to take place. I think at the moment, we're getting the kind of funding which in the next few months will enable us to start employing some key staff, including maybe a you know, professional fundraiser. But I'm hoping within a, within a year or so or less, we'll have the kind of funding which enable us to set up a launching conference, or even I, I prefer the word launching tribunal, because we really need to sit in, in judgment about what has to be done with our earth, and then see which of these commissions there is enough energy for to get them going. I don't think that we want a huge organization with a huge secretary running 20, or at the moment the list has 24 commissions. You'll find them all on World Future Council, all in one word, dot um, org. Um, I think that we need uh, ideally have like some host organizations, uh, maybe host cities, but even better credible host organizations to say, okay, we will be responsible for the commission on good work for all. And um, I was looking for chairs for these commissions. There is a, a German professor, Richard Bertman, who's worked both in South Africa and in, in the US, so he really has global experience on unemployment issues. I shared a platform with him and Zola Nisad al Alama at the World uh, the German Church Days last year talked about this. We had 20,000 most of the young people there. So there is a lot of a lot of interest. We are doing a sort of summary at the moment, uh, what we call a World Future Report, where we are now looking for authors to just do a very short summary on each of these 24 issues, saying where are we at at the moment, where are we heading to, and where could we be headed to, and you know what are the practical steps to go there. And then we'll find that in some areas there's something you can get a a majority on tomorrow, much of the transition to a sustainable energy culture. It's basically the information is there. You know, we can mobilize public opinion around that. People want it, north and south. You know, they realize that all the solar energy of yesterday, which we didn't use, was wasted forever. So to have a situation where you measure, you compare the extraction cost of solar energy, of renewable energy, with non-renewables, when actually they are totally opposite. I mean, with non-renewable, as you know, it's the one you used yesterday, which has gone forever, with, forever. With a renewable, it's a, the energy you didn't use yesterday, which has gone forever. So obviously, we need to shift the way we calculate our energy use. And that you can get a majority for tomorrow. Just needs a concerted campaign for a world energy charter, for example. Norman Scheer has been working on this. We could mobilize for that, as soon as we can get the, the council going. Other issues like uh, monetary reform are considerably more complex. You need much more much more education, much more research on that. So, uh, you know, it won't all happen in parallel, but I think enough will happen, you know, quickly enough and people realize that there is a body which is actually not just a talking shop, because there are the parliamentarians linked to it, which is not just going to end up, you know, producing a nice report, but which is part of a concerted process, not another competitive organization. I said everybody is welcome. We are looking for institutional um, Partners, and you know we've had a couple of institutions who are come founding founding partners for this. It is not a, not a competition. It's not another NGO. It's a process to bridge the implementation gap. Oh, I'm looking for hands, and if you have a hand, you can say your name and if you represent any organization, if you want. Oh, guys. Okay. My name is Guy Horton, and I work on the main industry of Burma. And uh, while I totally agree with almost everything you say, and feel a deep sympathy for it, I have two questions in my mind um, as I was listening to you. And one, one is this, this issue of peace. Um, and to ask you, where did, what, what do you think about Rwanda's, about Sarajevo's, about um, Burma, which is very close to us here, um, 
when you have a situation where peace does not seem to work in any way whatsoever, um, and you know, this is dramatically illustrated by the situation in Hong San Suu Kyi's ambush last year, and she's a Nobel Peace Prize winner, she won the election, um, she, her, her safety being guaranteed by the regime, by the UN envoy, she was very careful to make sure her followers did nothing provocative, and when the cars were stopped and surrounded, she asked her people not to resist, and they were simply cut down. Um, and if you think of Rwanda, 800,000 people were killed there and, and, and various other places. So one of the things I wrestle with in trying to find a way of responding to what's happening in Burma is the natural allies like yourself or people like here, I'm not sure how they um, can think about responding to a regime like this. And while I accept that huge numbers of people are being killed indirectly, lack of clean water, malaria, and all the rest of it, on occasions, huge numbers of people are deliberately, actively killed by these regimes, directly. And the West European pacifist, left of centre movement is not very good at responding to that. Maybe we don't know how to respond to it, but it is, it is a fact. And, and the second thing is the uneasiness in my mind, sometimes about the globalisation issue. Um, because some of the leading anti-globalisation politicians of the 20th century were people like Paul Pot, Mao Zedong, Stalin, Hitler. They were all deeply committed to fighting and ridding themselves from being enmeshed in some kind of international capitalism. And I don't know if this is true or not, but one of the reasons maybe why the Pakistan-Indian war did not occur a couple of years ago was, was massive pressure from people like Microsoft saying that they might withdraw from India if a nuclear war took place. Now, I, I'm only being slightly devil's advocate here, but what I'm trying to do is just to, to, um, to share some concerns in mind about the issue of peace when confronted with diabolical violence and deceit. And sometimes maybe those people who are anti-globalization may be associated with nationalism that actually can create more violence. Do you see what I mean? I, I do deeply respect what you say and I believe what you say, but it almost seems to me that you're coming from a sane, rational, humane world. And sometimes, you know, those assumptions don't apply in Rwanda or Sarajevo or modern Burma. You know, when um, I was young, my father took me to um, the trial of one of the um, main Nazi uh, butchers of the Jewish ghetto in uh, Warsaw. And I'd read so many um, reports of these trials, and they were sort of saying that you know, these men were not, you know, they were nice so grandfathers, and you know, why put them on trial again? And I know when I entered that courtroom, I was a little worried that this man would look like a nice old grandfather. I'd find difficult to feel any antipathy to him. And, and he looked up, and evil just shone out of his face. I'm convinced that, you know, there, there is evil. And um, there, is, there are smaller or larger opportunities for evil. And of course, what happened in these cases was that people who were disposed to evil and had become neighborhood thugs suddenly had the opportunity to become, to become mass murderers. And um, my father was a refugee from Nazism, and I wrestled um, a lot with the situation in, in Bosnia, where suddenly it seemed that we had fascism in Europe again. But you know, what is the right thing to do? And I finally decided that um, I was not a pacifist, and that intervention, we had, there, had, there was an international order built up in the United Nations. And if a country is a member of the United Nations and is aggressed, like Bosnia was, we have it has a right to expect to be defended by the global community. And I went back to my native Sweden, and together with the actress Bibi Anderson, we set up a new political party called the Sarajevo List to fight on, purely on that issue. Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time when um, the, uh, the Iraq preparation for the Iraq war began, I felt instinctively that it was you know, totally wrong. It was not just a breach of the UN charter, it was basically <coughs> breaching the whole um, order, international order, last 350 years without replacing it. But at the same time, I mean, I also have friends who worked on, on human rights there. I mean, I know the, the oppression. And it was always the struggle what to, uh, you know, what to do. And I was sort of helped by the statement of Viktor Frankl, um, a Jewish-Austrian philosopher who survived the Holocaust, who said that sometimes the right thing to do is only 55% right. But you still have to act on these 55%. 
And I think that's, you know, very, very true. And so um, every issue, I think, is basically has to be looked at on its own merits. So there's no parallel, really, between, to me, you know, Bosnia and Burma and Rwanda, so once you start looking at the details. And what happened in, in Bosnia was a clear aggression, which, uh, because the European Union couldn't get it back together, it tried to pretend was a, tried to pretend was a civil war. And it's still suffering the consequences of creating the kind of apartheid, where the, the aggressors, i.e., not the Serbs, because we gave the right ladder the war to those Serbs in Bosnia who were working with the Bosnian government to preserve the multi-ethnic, multicultural Bosnia, the, 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 the Serb, Serb Council of Sarajevo. But the Serb aggressors, the, 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 the thugs, the terrorists, funded by Milosevic, they were given half the country. So I think that was a major mistake, and that's the reason why we are having the situation over the ethnic split now. Um, what happened in, in, in Rwanda was quite clearly that you know one um, major power, namely France, conducted a policy there which was absolutely outrageous and uh, prevented the, the UN, and the others didn't really intervene. France's role was the worst, but even the others didn't intervene. I mean, there was a UN general there who had a warning, clear intelligence was going to happen, and he called for reinforcements, and he just he was not given them, and he's even told not to interfere. He, 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 he offered to, to raid the secret arms dumps, and he was told not to do it. And, you know, he, he uh, afterwards he became uh, sort of mentally sick because of, you know, what he felt he could have prevented if he, you know, wondered whether he should have just ignored the orders and just gone ahead and do it. And um, what's going on in Burma, I mean, reminds us again that although the people like to think that the EU, you know, it's Europe is a bit better than the USA, in this case, I and mean, in the Burma case, the, the EU position has to be scandalous because, I mean, there are these, uh, um, you know, selected purchasing laws passed, for example, by the state of Massachusetts uh, banning state orders for any company, any U.S. company, which um, or any company, U.S. or not, which does business with Burma, with the Kuta. And um, the EU has been suing uh, the U.S., you know, Massachusetts via the U.S., and through the Dual Trade Organization, trying to get this law declared to be discriminatory impediment to trade. So I think, again, there, you know, no nation can really resist the total international boycott of its elites. But, of course, the... Uh, the, the, the Burmese rulers are not being boycotted or isolated. And there's even less excuse in many other countries where, you know, the alternative to the strongman is, uh, is, seems to be chaos. Because in Burma it's not chaos, it's all there. I mean, there is the elected leader is there. And so um, it's even more outrageous that uh, the West, which claims to be interested in the democracy, is not doing anything. And I think, again, the problem is that, you know, we're saying this here and we're saying this there, but I think we need to create a stronger ongoing voice which says this, who speaks up for our values as, as citizens. And that, of course, used to be the role of, of the churches or religious leaders. But as we know, they don't really dare to do this. And when they do it, they do it so weakly uh, because they're afraid that if they do it more strongly and they aren't taken seriously, then it'll just show how weak they are. And I mean, I was talking uh, last year um, at a meeting organized of, of uh, mainly of Christian leaders uh, from all the three uh, main Christian traditions organized by the Patriot of Constantinople, a meeting of scientists, religious leaders, and environmental leaders. And um, I said, you know, we need stronger leadership from, you know, if the churches are there, surely they must care about the planet, about creation, surely this is our own. What about excommunicating a few of the worst sinners, the polluters? And there was kind of horrified silence. And finally, one English bishop, old English bishop, stood up and said, no, 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 the churches can only lead from behind. <coughs> I said, well, what are you waiting for? He said, well, the only thing which can wake people up is a disaster in the rich countries. So I said, you know, what are you thinking about? He said, well, like the flooding of London. He said, well, it's quite remarkable that here you have old English bishops going around hoping that London will be flooded in order to wake, uh, wake the believers up. Um, and you have this, you have, I mean, I spoke in, in, in Switzerland, one of these, you know, the churches are now setting up these centers for management training. And, but you go there and you find that actually the, the managers you meet there, the people from industry, from business, I mean, they are more open than these, these guys are who are running the show. I mean, this leader of the center was saying, well, of course, um, you know, there were three ways of persuading people, and one is the moral way. But so that doesn't work anymore. Moral institutions have collapsed. You know? And um, the state, of course, used to pass laws, and that doesn't work anymore because people don't like rules. So then it's just the, the way, you know, business does it, was sort of, you know, trying to attract people through, you know, in an, as, as consumers. That's the only way. We somehow have to sort of formulate our message so that it becomes attractive to people as consumers. And I said, well, you know, um, I thought, 
I was at a, at a meeting organized by a church institution, not by the advertising industry. So um, there is this bankruptcy of these existing institutions, and of course, as a result of which, people become very, very cynical about them. And uh, so we need to recreate institutions which speaks up for us as, as citizens, because our elected governments are more or less in the pockets of consumer interests. And, you know, they will always look at the bottom line, and uh, so all the time you will have been told, well, yes, we do appreciate your concern as a human rights activist, and you have brought, brought us five million signatures now saying that we should really take stronger measures against, um, uh, against the Burmese generals. But you must understand that yesterday we were visited by, you know, five businessmen who are responsible for creating 5,000 new jobs, and these jobs will be lost if we don't allow them to trade with, you know, Burma. And so we need a stronger international institution that basically says, look, this is totally irrelevant whether there are 5,000 jobs or not. There are more important things than jobs. There are more important things than making money. And, you know, if you don't do that, we are going to keep on denouncing and exposing you every day and make you into a moral paria. And um, this is a method which no elective politician can resist. I mean, Lyndon Johnson um, resigned because, um, you know, if every day he left the White House, he would hear the chant of, you know, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? I mean, nobody can stand this for very long. Um, com uh, leaders from the, uh, the private sector, when I say to them, well, you know, what made you change? They, they come and they are really sort of seeking. And they said, well, I was tired of my, my children telling me at dinner every night that I was destroying that planet and that future. So um, I think this is why we need to speak up. So it's outrageous. I mean, I speak to, you know, I don't know how many different audiences. I always, I always make, give this example. I say, now, if you lend a poor African, to say, a poor Burmese, $1,000, and he or she came back after a couple of years and repaid you $1,000, would you pursue him or her for compound interest on this money for year after year, even if you knew that that money, the compound interest you were forcing them to pay you, was costing, was endangering the health and education of their children. Of course, nobody, nobody says, yes, I will do that. But that's being done every day by our governments, by our international institutions, by our banks in our name. And, you know, if you look into the animal kingdom, which especially young people, you know, care, care about us, where we now have these terrorist organizations in, in, in Europe uh, who, are, who care more about animals than about people, who, who you know, are prepared to endanger people's lives to save animals, but they have just been so horrified by living in a Europe where it's, and uh, this horses, cows, pigs, sheep, 25 million, 10 percent are dead on arrival. The half-dead rest is uneaten by, by us, those free to eat. Uh, but the, uh, it still pays, the system still pays. But of course, morally, ethically, and not just, these are not European values, they are not Asian values, they are human values. It's totally outrageous. But it needs to be spoken you know, daily with a, with a stronger voice, the, the voice of commercial speech, which isn't just the advertisements we hear. It's these you know, business leaders sitting there, seeing our politicians every day going to have dinner with them and saying, you know, you, do you realize what this means, you know, if you introduce this boycott, let the market, you know, the market will somehow, look what happened in South Africa, soon or later, you know, we were able to, and then of course others say, no, it was without you this much, sure, it was the boycott, which stopped South Africa, the party system, it wasn't the companies who stayed there, and the right very well have provided slightly different terms than others, but it, you know, but it was the whole system, it was feeling that they were an international paria, which made, Maybe it could be a microphone. I don't know. Can you speak up? My name is Eddie. I'm just an observer. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions. In the first part of the speech, you have uh, highlighted the ideas of the Green Party or the Radical Party. How much members are in the European Union of this Green Party and Radical, radical Party in view of the fact that the election in France and Germany almost wipe out many of the Green Party. So how can you justify your party? That's the one question. And the second question is, now after Cancun, it seems that the World Trade Organization has collapsed or not because of Brazil and India and so forth. So what is the likeliest of the scenario for the World Trade Organization? And does the North, Northern countries, just to admit that this 
because of globalization and because of the unfairness that the third world countries are suffering. Thank you. I think what happened in national politics in Europe, and uh, I mean the German Green Party at the moment is doing very well in the in the opinion post because uh, many people are so disillusioned with the Social Democrats and Joschka Fischer is a very charismatic politician, although I have a you know very strong disagreements with him. Um, but uh, in other countries, they have become so um, weak, as you say, and also the electoral system is such you know, that you know, they have managed to stay such a small party that they have made alliances. I mean, in France now, they, they allied themselves to the Social Democrats, and they have done it in a couple of other countries too. And they actually did quite well in that, in that alliance, which will then guarantee them a couple of seats. But in the new East European countries, they have basically disappeared. I mean, they, they exist. You know, they are... How big are they? Well, some may have a few hundred, some may have a few thousand members. There's a European Green Coordination, which uh, <coughs> which meets. So they're basically there is a Green Party in um, in every country, but um, in very few of these countries are they are they in Parliament? In even fewer are they in government? And um, that was during the 90s. There were more of them. When um, the Soviet system collapsed, there was a time when you couldn't really declare that you were a liberal or conservative, but you could declare that you were a green. So suddenly there were these masses of greens in Eastern Europe, but then you know, when the politics changed, it turned out that they were not really green greens at all. It was just you know, sort of politically opportunist thing. But in most countries, the, the, um, the, the, the system is still such that small parties are discriminated against. And the problem is that, to me, that the Green Party has remained uh, minority party because it uh, did not highlight the, the issue. It had an issue which is uh, the most important issue of it for our survival, uh, but it sort of joined the existing streams and positioned itself somewhere inside, inside the existing left-right spectrum and you know, found this niche, which is a niche where you can get 3% and can get 7 or 10%. But I remember a friend of mine who is now also um, rightly left and who started the Green Party and was mainstream about uh, 10 years ago, he was one of the kind of broke the program, former member of the European Parliament and the candidate in the Paris and the suburb of, uh, of Munich, so you know, you know, fundamentally explaining. But he always used to say, when the Greens were really, you know, 10% and they said, oh, it's 6%, you know, they said, oh, it's 6%, and they used to say, when you, when you look around the world, then anything less than 51% is really not a victory. And this was growth. It turned out that it was, it was right. And that's, of course, one of the most successful propaganda lies of the established order, because the limits to growth uh, report was basically true. It's just, I mean, they didn't get everything completely right. They, <coughs> they underestimated the oil reserves probably by, by a few decades, you know. So then they'll run out 20 or 30 years later, but it doesn't really matter because we live off cheap oil, not of oil, but of cheap oil. And the, the, the maximum oil uh, reserves in the world will have been reached in a couple of years' time. <coughs> and after that, and people realize that psychologically, of course, the oil, um, the countries with large reserves will then really realize they have a, something very valuable, which also the chemical industry wants, so they will hold back, they can increase the price, they have an enormous monopoly power, um, which is, of course, why the, the U.S. looked around and... Um, saw that there were three countries with big reserves left. One of them they have now occupied. Second one, Saudi Arabia, they still have a strong influence in. And um, the third one, Venezuela, they tried to overthrow the democratic elected president once, and I'm sure they'll try again. So um, this is the situation. But there are other areas, like soil erosion, for example, where the, the, uh, what has happened since the Club of Rome report came out is actually much worse than they predicted. And it's interesting that, you know, when you actually look at all these alternative uh, quality of life indicators, you know, alternative to the GDP economic growth indicators, they all begin to diverge around the time the Club of, uh, Club of Rome report came out. So, you know, until then, quality of life and GDP had about grown at the same speed. But since then, you find that quality of life stagnates or is going down in kind of, while GDP growth will continue. Why is that? That is because more and more of what of expenses, what is counted as GDP growth, are defensive expenditures to deal with the consequences of the limits to growth. And economic globalization is, as our award recipient, Professor Herman Davis, put it, 
a last attempt by some countries to escape natural limits to economic growth by growing into the economic and environmental space of other countries. And that is basically what in private car traffic of 95% within a few months. It can't be done. There's no doubt about it. You know, once the will has to be over